So this is a short, easy lecture. We're just going to talk about some of the things that you need to be worrying about on top of all the other things we've told you you need to worry about um, when you would like your sample, your live cell imaging samples to be live. Um, so I'm going to start with a little enticement here. These are, these are cells. Um, this is a movie that was taken in a, a Cold Spring Harbor laboratory course that I taught in years ago. And there's a great contrast to be up there. But um, these are uh, cells that are expressing um, M. cherry histone and some form of GST tubulin. You can see that not all the cells are expressing growth. So there's a cell in the center that only has BH2B. But you can also see on the type, top right corner is a mitotic um, cell in metaphase. And then the bottom left is a cell that is in um, late anaphase. Okay. So I'm going to play this movie now and we can see what we think. So we see the cell at the top undergo mitosis, the one, or sorry, undergo um, uh, anaphase, and the one at the bottom is like pinching out. Beautiful, right? No, crap, <laughs> garbage. Okay, so here is the corresponding DIC image, uh, differential interference contrast. So this is just the transmitted light image that was taken alongside um, the fluorescence images. And you, I think you can see the nucleus in the center, right? Top right, oh, yes, top right here are the chromosomes from the mitotic spindle, you can see those sort of clear area where the microtubules are. And then this guy, you can sort of see the chromosome, I'm just proving she has the same field of view. Um, <laughs> the uh, chromatin here and here. Okay, so if I play that one, first off, things seem to be going well. And then about here, you can, if you listen closely, you can hear the screaming um, as these cells uh, die. Right, and this is the same length of time as we were just watching. Um, what you have to remember when you are doing fluorescent live imaging, you are imaging one or in this case two proteins. It is not necessarily the case that one or the, one of those proteins is going to accurately report to you that your cell is sick in the bucket, right? And so it is incredibly important that you not just look at one or two proteins and make a decision about whether or not your cell is, is um, uh, handling the elimination. Okay. That was my trick. It's better than Kelly's trick. Mm -hmm. Trickier than Kelly's trick. All right. I, I, I want you guys to, to have an understanding of what we are doing to these four cells. So I'm going to walk through a calculation of how much light we're actually putting on a cell when we do um, fluorescence microscopy. And I'm going to do this for wide field fluorescence to begin. So, and this is a conservative estimate, right? I'm being, I'm being very uh, uh, generous with, or, or conservative, you know, picking a low bar as far as how much light we're using. We often use more than this is what I'm trying to say. So let's say we're using a 75 watt lamp for illumination and that for each sort of nanometer across the spectrum, because of course we're not gonna use all the entire spectrum coming out of that lamp, we're just gonna use some band, right? That passes through our, our fluorescence filter. And so let's say we get about one milliwatt per nanometer of light. And we're going to illuminate with blue light um, and we're using an excitation filter that has a 10 nanometer band. That's really narrow. Like normally you would use one that's more like 20, 25. So that's what I mean by conservative. 10, 10, 10 nanometer band. And it's only allowing for 60% of the light. Again, very conservative. They're usually higher than that. Um, and then we're going to use a dichroic mirror that's going to reflect that excitation light up to our specimen. So we're going to say that has that reflects 85% of the light. And then we have 100x objective lens, 1.32 NA, and it is able to transmit 95% of that light through, through the objective to reach your sample. So if we have, uh, calculate that, what we get is a total light dose 
of 4.8 milliwatts. Now that's all the light that's hitting the field of view. So we really need to think about this. We want to think about how much light is hitting the cell. We have to think of this, about this per unit area, right? And so we can calculate the size of the field of view with that lens. And we can determine that we have a light flux hitting that cell that is 380 watts per centimeter squared. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, I'll put it into some context. Um, that is about 200 and, or 2,500 times the intensity of the light hitting the earth on the brightest day. Okay, let that sink in for a moment. And now that slide field, the gentlest of the technique. If we think about when we're taking a laser, a high power laser and focusing that all into one tiny little spot and putting it on your cells, now we're off the chart. Okay. So when you're doing live cell imaging and your cells appear to stay live, you should be fascinated. You should not be shocked when they're dead. You should be amazed that they can stay alive when you are doing them. Um, and how much light do your the cell type that you are studying normally see? in its environment? Probably not. <laughs> Maybe if you're studying, you just want to live on a grape or something, but in, in the case of mammalian cells, I mean, there are very few cell types that are used to light. So you're bombarding these cells that have never, you know, that have not evolved to see photons with ridiculously amounts of, amounts of light. So it really is amazing that we can get away with this. Um, and in many cases, we can't. Uh, and so there's many things that, that you can see go wrong with cells. Um, uh, the top left corner there, you see blebbing, which is what we saw happen in that movie. Um, the necrosis, so that's just a cell that crapped out dead. Uh, a long-term phenotype of too much light exposure is the is multinucleate cells, so they're not under, able to undergo cytokinesis and they start to accumulate nuclei over time. Uh, vacuoles on the board, bottom left, that's a really common one. That I've also uh, seen as a, often seen as a phenotype of poor tissue and cult tissue culture technique. So sometimes the cells come in and they look like that, but that is something to look for um, developing over time. And then swollen mitochondria, I think uh, Uri showed a, an image of this, where over time the, the mitochondria are a pretty good recorder of stress and they sort of swell up. Um, over time. And then protein aggregation, that's sort of not necessarily as a result of um, live imaging, but something to keep keep an eye out for. So yeah, you need to you need to understand that these things can happen. Um, none of this is normal. <laughs> and uh, important to to control for, so, which is what I'll get to. You. Um, now, <clears throat> The, the things on the last slide are, is you're doing garbage science, right? And it's super obvious if you just look for it in a transmitted light image. Um, some of the effects of phototoxicity are much subtler, right? So it's not the case that you go from everything's just fine to oh, it explodes. There can be phenotypes that when you start look, digging into this can be a little scary. So this is a, a review um, that one of my uh, former fellows uh, wrote with the collaborator. And it is a chart which is summarizing papers that have published a phenotype that they have identified as being caused by overlumination and what they did to correct it. So you've got the, the row with the papers where this was shown. And then just to, I'm not gonna go through all these, but things like um, slowing down of microtubule growth. That's one we've had people come, I've had people come to me in the core and say, there's something wrong with the temporal sampling because my microtubules are too slow and it was like things. So that's one we've definitely seen. Um, slowing down embryonic development. What else? Slowing down neuronal migration, relaxation of cellular contract contractility. Um, yeah, there's a lot of them. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's, there are these dramatic phenotypes like glubbing that you sort of can't miss if you know what to look for, but there may be subtler things happening as well. And it's this is tricky because 
we don't really know what all of the possible phenotypes of phototoxicity are. And there are also almost certainly things that you won't be able to identify on, on the sort of macro scale when you're looking at the whole cell. So what we have to do is walk into a live cell imaging experience, experiment expecting the worst and do control to convince yourself that your that your cells are tolerating this light dose that you are you are challenging them with. And so <clears throat> the, some of the controls you can think about doing are things like uh, this is sort of a bare minimum, looking at the cells before and after you image them with transmitted light. So not just looking at your one or two or three, however many proteins you've labeled, um, but the whole cell. And this is something like you really need to get to know what your happy cells look like. You know, spend some time with them. Look around the cover slip, see how much, you know, tissue culture cells, you're going to see some weird ones and hopefully a lot of nice ones. Like get to know what they should look like when you haven't blasted them with a laser. Um, and always inspect them before and after. And you can compare the cells that you've been illuminating, like after your experiment, look at the ones you're illuminating and then look at another field of view. There should be no visible differences in a transmitted light image. That might be the next one, yeah. I mean, I gotta throw this in here. Uh, the cells should behave normally. I don't know what that means either, but anything that you don't expect to happen, um, whether it's what you're studying or not, could be a result of the photo damage. So common ones are, you know, the slowing down, you saw those examples of things slowing down or preventing progression through mitosis or other development. Um, some, sometimes cells like flatten out when they're when they're pissed off and sometimes they round up. And so again, it's sort of getting to know what is normal behavior for your cells. <clears throat> Some of the damage that occurs can be damage to DNA, for example, that will not have an immediate phenotype. And so that's the example that I showed earlier with the multinucleus cell. So it is a good idea, depending on what you're studying, to go to do your imaging, put it back in the incubator, come back the next day and take a look and see if everybody looks okay. Um, again, not all of these are possible for, for all experiments, but if you're doing sort of a longer term imaging experiment and you can compare that to a fixed time point assay, um, which if you're not sure what I mean by that, it's like, let's say you're imaging, you're collecting an image every 30 minutes for you know some number of hours. Well, sit at your bench and every 30 minutes, Fix, you know, make a bunch of cover slips, do your drug treatment, whatever you're doing, and every 30 minutes, fix a different cover slip. And then look at that fixed time point and see if it matches what you're seeing in the live experiment. And that's a great control. Now, you know, if you're trying to collect every, images every 10 seconds, I personally wouldn't be able to do that fixed time point after they you could. But, um, but yeah, it requires, you know, a reasonable time frame in order to be able to do that. All right, so what do you do if you're having problems with your um, live imaging? <clears throat> the first thing you want to rule out is if the damage is coming from the, the environment that the cells are in versus the light. So when we're doing live imaging, we're often, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this sort of extra hardware, like the chain incubation chambers in a moment. But often, we're, we're using some sort of incubation chamber to main, maintain temperature, for example. And sometimes we're also switching media that we're using. So, so sometimes we switch to a different media for imaging than we're using for growing the cells for various reasons. And so both of those things could be the problem or contributing to the problem. And so to check the media situation, you want to swap the media out and then just put it back in the incubation, your, your regular incubator. So the only difference there is the media and make sure that they are okay with that media that you're using for imaging. <clears throat> For the imaging chamber that you're using to maintain chamber uh, uh, temperature on the microscope, just put your cells on the microscope and go away. Don't do a time lapse. Just stick them in that chamber, and then come back, you know, later and see if they're still okay. Right. So now we've eliminated the 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 other things in the environment when that those cells are sitting on the microscope, and now we can worry about light and and whether that might be what's causing the problem. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that you have optimized your microscope for maximum collection of signal, right? Because if you're not collecting as much as is possible with your microscope, 
then you're going to have to compensate for that by illuminating the floor floors with higher intensity illumination or by collecting longer exposure times. You're going to, you know, in some way suffer from that. So go through your light path and your specimen and think about all the things that Riley and I told you that you can worry about to, to optimize for collection of signal, like the specification of your filters, whether you're using a decent floor for or not. Um, can you get, use a higher numerical aperture lens than what you've chosen? Have you considered spherical aberration? Are, are you, um, you know, can you set up your sample so that the, the cell is as close to the cover slip as possible because that will minimize spherical aberration, which will make the image brighter so that you can then lower the illumination intensity. Um, if you're doing an experiment where you're imaging two colors, just image one, image one at a time. Right, because if it can't handle one color, it's not going to be able to handle two for sure. All right, so if it's if you've gone through all this and, and and everything's okay, then you want to try to figure out is there a light dose that these cells can handle. And the way to do that is to just minimize the amount of light that you are putting on those cells until you are collecting a visible but crappy image. Like this is where you're shooting for lowest possible signal to noise ratio that you can still identify that the structures that like you don't have to be able to see them well, you just know they're there and in the focal plane and they're being a little bit excited. Start there, right? And then um, run, run your experiment. This is not gonna be usable data, but run the experiment and look at whatever phenotype has convinced you that the cells are suffering, probably in transmitted light, check to see how they're doing. And then just creep up you know, slowly creep up the light until you find the dose. I mean, if they die right away, then some cells are just not going to tolerate light. It's quite rare, but we definitely had people who brought things in that I could just never get them to stay alive on the microscope. But that's rare. It's usually the primary neuron. Um, but the, uh, uh, right, but, you know, if, it, if it's fine at the lowest dose, then just creep up the illumination until you get a signal to noise ratio that your, your image analysis algorithms will be satisfied by, um, uh, but you don't see any damage. And you can even, you know, it's kind of nice to go up until you do see the damage, so you get an idea of how far you are away. You want to be as far away from the point at which you can recognize damage as possible. Um, okay, so that's warning you about phototoxicity. Yeah. I'm sure this depends on the different wavelengths of light, but I'm curious with in general the type of toxicity to the light specific something additive like radiation, for example, that like it doesn't matter if you wait for long enough time, once something is received, say 10 grades, like whether you it, it just builds up over time, even if you wait. Yeah. I know I'm not even gonna try to answer that because the truth is we don't really understand a lot about it. Do you want to answer something? Oh. Um yeah, you just we just don't know. I mean, we know some things. We know that it's not just the light directly damaging the cells. It's the um, the reactive oxygen species that result in the fluorescence reaction. Um, but as far as like, yeah, we don't really we don't know all the things that are affected by light. Um, any other questions? Something you can say is. Right now, maybe the best thing we have is looking at the transmitted light and what seems to be the front of the fine. The cells can be like humans and we could be doing terrible experiments, but they look fine on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you can see it, it's too late. Uh, this is a really big problem. We have we were chatting about this yesterday, or we, we don't have, we have any idea how big it will cost us. It'd be interesting, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, what we're looking back on and thinking. No one has taken on my knowledge. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, speaking of focus, um, so if you've done any live cell imaging, you know, depending on your microscope, I guess at this point, but <laughs> um, 
folk, maintaining focus over time can be an issue, right? And this is absolutely effective. This is not like your microscope stops or your core director's blacking off. This is effective, right? Um, the focus, and, and if you just have your standard microscope and are not trying to adjust address focus change at all, the focus will change over time, due primarily to two things. One is drift within the focus mechanism. So you've got, you know, this nose piece that has a bunch of objective lenses on it. So it has some weight to it. And there's some gears in there that you're moving with the focus knob to move that up and down. Well, over time, gravity is going to be pulling on that nose piece and pull it, pull it down. Okay. And, you know, obviously not dramatically, but it doesn't have to be dramatic. It can be a micron and it's going to be a lot. The other thing is uh, what we call thermal drift, which is that as the temperature, the local temperature changes, and the materials in your microscope expand and contract, you will see change in focus as a result of that. So this is a pain in the ass and something that we want to deal with. And there are multiple solutions. Um, one is what I call graduate student-based autofocusing. This is the one I did. This is where you sit at the microscope and an image pops up and it's out of focus. And you tweak the focus and hope to dodge you went in the right direction. And then, yeah. So um, <laughs> now you guys don't have to do that. Um, what you can do is most uh, software acquisition software packages will have some sort of software based autofocusing. So, what this does is it takes, you know, moves the focus motor up and down and takes images and then it runs some algorithm that assesses brightness or edges or something that is indicative of focus. And it will tell you, it will park you at the right, the best focal point, what it thinks is the best focal point. Obviously it's not perfect. You know, the software might not take the same focal frame you would by eye, um, but they can be really helpful. Not something I would recommend doing on the fluorescence image because it does require collecting quite a few images before it can determine what is the best focal plane. So it's something that you would need to do on the transmitted light image. <laughs> now, the gold standard at this point are the hardware-based autofocus systems. So these are things like the perfect focus system on Nikon, the definite focus system on Zeiss. I don't remember the names of all of them, but they all sound perfect and definite and great. They all, the different companies do this in different ways. So I'm going to explain, this is how Nikon does it. I think many of them are very similar. There's a couple that are totally different, but just to give you an idea of what this is, it's incredibly, it was the best thing ever when this came out. As a core director, you, before this stuff, you had people all the time, your microscope's drifting, your microscope's drifting, you know, you had to explain to them why microscope's drifting. Um, so this is fantastic when this, when this came out, it's great to so what, what, what they do here is they have a far red LED with wavelengths that you're not going to use for your experiments in most cases. So this far red LED is um, reflected off a dichroic mirror. And this is not the dichroic mirror in your filter set. This is a separate dichroic mirror placed in the microscope for this purpose. And the light um, is reflected off the mirror, comes up through the objective, and it comes in at an angle such that it is going to reflect off a surface. Now, if you're working with a dry lens, it will reflect off the cover slip surface. If you have immersion oil and a cover slip, you don't have a change in refractive index there, so it's not it's going to reflect off the interface between the cover slip and your sample. But one of those two, depending on if it's oil or dry lens, is going to reflect back down through the objective lens, reflect off that dichroic, same dichroic mirror down to what is called a line CCD. So this is just like the photo dot, the Callie told you about the array of photodiodes, which are the cameras that we use. This is just one row of photodiodes. And the idea here is that if you think about what it means to maintain focus as far as the microscope is concerned, it is maintaining the distance between the objective and the cover slit, right? That's the best we can ask the microscope to do for the most, I mean, I guess deep learning, whatever, but. Um, <laughs> But as far as hardware is concerned, that's the best you can ask for. If your cell is doing this, you know, it's not going to follow it around. Um, short deep learning. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to maintain that distance between the, the objective and the cover slip. And so the light that's reflected off that surface and it comes back down, it's calibrated such it should hit the center of that line CCD. So that's where you're going to start. You're going to say, this is the focal plane I want, and it's going to focus right in the center of that line CCD. 
Now, if the distance between the objective and the cover slip starts to change and drift, what will happen is that that um, uh, that return beam will will shift as well along that line sensor and begin to defocus. And so that is detected. And then the software or the the microscope will change its focus to get that back um, into the center. Yeah. So what is it actually? moving for you to define the, the center, like the focus that you want? Um, so it depends uh, It depends on the individual system, how, how that actually works. So this is showing you the, sorry? Oh, I thought oh, you were sorry, sorry. 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 Um, <clears throat> So in the case of the Nikon system, they have this offset lens. And so that is what you're actually using to, to do focus. So it, it, you're moving that lens and that's changing your focus on, on the sample, and it's also changing the position on the sensor. Um, that's patented from, from Nikon, so I actually am not 100% sure how Zeiss does it. I'm pretty sure, if it hasn't changed since I first learned about it, they actually have to move back and forth between the, the surface where the reflection is occurring and whatever position you want to focus in in order to like check the focus. So it'll pop up you know, to where you are or where you want to focus, where you've told it to be, but then it has to go back down to the cover slip to sense where, uh, or, or for the sensor to work. Does that make sense? So it keeps like, yeah, it keeps going back up and down. Yeah, I don't know if it still works that way because I learned that a long, long time ago. How they did it because Nikon had the patent. Yeah, the, uh, the offset lens is patented, so I know it's different, but. I think it's no longer on patent. Oh, that could be, yeah. And I think since then, I said, I think They probably have. Yeah, Nikon, when Nikon, they all came out with it about the same time, different versions. And I'm not saying this because I run a Nikon imaging center, believe me. Um, <laughs> plenty of bad things to say, but they did a really good job with this. At least the second version. The first version we called the not so perfect focus. But the second version was awesome. Um, and they sold a shit ton of microscopes over it. So yeah, I would think yeah. everybody would copy that as a pattern themselves. But, but that's just my Yeah. So there's various ways to do it, and there are other there are other systems that use totally different ways. But the idea is to, um, in the hardware, maintain that distance between the cover slip and um, and the objective. And I mean, they're fantastic. You can go up and do this to the stage, and it'll pop right back into focus. I don't recommend it, <laughs> but it is possible. All right. So um, so hardware, you know, going now through like extra hardware that's great for live cell imaging. So autofocusing mechanism, fantastic. Another thing that most samples or many samples need is some method of maintaining the environment. And in particular, you want to maintain temperature, pH, and osmolarity. Those three things you need to maintain over time. And so temperature, we need a, a heat source in most cases. Um, some things you need to cool. So most time we need some sort of heat. pH, we need some buffering capacity. Like if you're most tissue culture cells or many tissue culture cells, you're growing in a media that uses like a sodium bicarbonate system that requires CO2 in order to maintain buffering. If that's the situation you're in, if you're growing your cells in an incubator that has 5% CO2 and then you take them out, do not provide the CO2, then that's going to change. You're going to lose machine pH, it's going to change. And do some of your biology, certainly. And then if the humidity is low, then the media will start to drop. Okay. And now obviously if you run your time lapse and get back to your to your sample and the media is dried on the bottom of the dish, you know you've got a problem. But if any amount of evaporation, even a little bit of evaporation is occurring, then you are changing the osmolarity of the media and that can be damaging. Now the cells need all these things at the same time. And you probably all learned by now that stress is cumulative, right? And so you might have the, the temperature a little bit off and the pH is a little bit off and the osmolarity is a little bit off. And collectively, they're miserable, okay? So you need to pay attention to each one of these things and optimize for each one. At the same time, when you're deciding how to set up your microscope to do a, uh, and your specimen to do a live cell imaging experiment, we don't want to forget that the objective has its needs too. It wants to image through a number 1.5 cover slip, ideally to your sample attached to on the other side of the cover slip. And so we need to set up a chamber that will allow us to keep both the cells and the, um, the objective lens happy. So there's lots of solutions for this. 
There are uh, commercial available cover clip holders or custom. You can get like plans that you can send to your machine shop if you have one to have them build it for you. Um, but these are things where you grow yourself in a standard cover clip and then you take the cover clip and you mount it in this usually metal chamber. Um, and those are nice because you just need cheap cover clips and you know, but you got to clean it and you transfer cover clips around so it's a little more laborious. Uh, there are now these commercially available dishes um, where they are plastic dishes with either a hole in the bottom, as you can see here, a, a hole in the bottom of the uh, cover slip, or sorry, the hole in the bottom of the plastic, and then a cover slip adhered to the bottom. Um, we used to make these in grad school. We would take a grommet. Do you make them? Yeah. Well, we made them before these existed, drill right? Press. A drill press? Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah, um, we used to make them, you know, draw it a hole into the bottom of the cover slip and then put the, or sorry, the cover, the petri dish and then put a, um, uh, some silicon grease and put the plastic on there. And then somebody with much more business sense than I did, <laughs> you know, maybe commercial. And now you can pay a lot of money to have them do it for you. But they also sterilize them and stuff. So they're quite, they're quite convenient. Um, and now you can get them in any shape or form, uh, you know, multi-well plates. These are these are sort of a more slide shape with multiple wells. There's tons of these available. Um, and uh, you probably, if you're doing live film imaging, you're probably using them at this point. So you got to get yourself yourself into a, a, a chamber setup that is going to allow us to image through a cover yeah. I don't want to come up the chambers itself. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what about the, the follow-up cover slip? Like, Oh, like the um, like the plastic, yeah, plastic. They, they... I don't know. Um, all I would do is all I would do is tell you is to be skeptical. But yes, they they sell these plastic. They don't call them plastic polymer cover slips that are supposed to be optically clear. I don't know if they are hard for me to imagine. But That's, so, if they the example of a company that sells uh, non glass plastic yeah. with Glass optics. I have never gotten it to look as good. Oh, good. Yeah, we, we never tested them, but I don't believe anything um, <laughs> until, <laughs> until I've proven it to myself and you shouldn't either. But yeah, I would just, I mean, if you want to use, because some people say my cells won't grow on glass, they have to grow on plastic, yeah. and that's fine. I would try really freaking hard before you give up on that because you're always going to get the best image quality on. On glass, but you know maybe it can come close with plastic, and that's one of these sacrifices. If your cells are just not having the glass, and no coating on the glass, or no cleaning of the glass will make any difference to them, then you're just going to have to sacrifice the much quality to put them on the glass. And certainly, a plastic cover slip like that is much better than like it's just a feature dish. I, I know you mentioned like the number one point five closest number one you lost. Yeah. Besides thickness, like, is there any other downside using one of the other? Uh oh, like another one point five yeah. percent another one. No, that just refers to the thickness. It doesn't refer to anything else. So the X Y shape of it is to be anything. Okay. So even when you buy these dishes, they sell them as number one. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's lots of different methods of delivering heat to your sample. The sort of simplest one is um, uh, a, a piece of metal that you put on your stage in place of the piece of metal that's usually there, um, but it warms up. So, so this sort of stage heater that just sits on top of your stage and it warms up. So this is, you know, you've got a little heat going into your sample, but it's not great, right? You just have one source of heat coming from the bottom. Some of the stage top incubators, you, you sit on top of your stage as well, but they are enclosed as this one is. So, and they're delivering heat from not just the bottom, but also from the sides and sometimes from the top as well, depending on the manufacturer. Um, a, a problem with even this guy that is, this, this is one that's heated from, the glass is heated as well as the metal surrounding it. So it's heated from all sides, but if you're using this, with an oil immersion objective, right? You've got your sample that's being nicely heated, and then you take this objective lens, you put immersion oil, and you connect your sample 
to this enormous heat sink, which is your microscope, right? And this has been measured where you can see if you, if you um, there's one of the companies that did it, I can't remember who now, but um, they measure the, the temperature across the cover slip and you see this dip in intensity right where you're looking, okay? And so the, the sort of development after that to deal with that were objective heaters. And so an objective heater is what it sounds like. It's this little heater and you've got a collar that you wrap around the objective lens and it warms it up. These things <laughs> give me shivers. So the idea of like heating and cooling your objective lens and expanding and contracting all those elements, it's like, why would you do that to your poor precious little objective? Um, they did, uh, they are useful though, because you know the next one is gonna be the ones you've seen, the cages. Um, they're useful because you can turn them on and off. And my graduate advisor actually worked with Takai Hitt to design one that my graduate advisor is an, an engineer. So he helped them design one that is um, that, that raises in temperature, but really slowly over time. So it causes less physical damage over time to the objective lenses. But like, if, it, if you have to let it heat up for 12 hours before you can do your experiment, you're not really saving a lot of, like, it's not easy to switch back and forth between users who need room temperature and users who need um, uh, heated. So that's why these guys came in. Um, we used to build these uh, out of plexiglass and, and I'm just like in the mood to tell old stories. The first <laughs> um, when I was, I was in Ted Hammond's lab with Claire Waterman and she built one, the first uh, enclosure that I'm aware of by going to Home Depot and buying some piping that she built around the microscope and then draped it with heavy plastic and brought in her blow dryer. <laughs> so these, there have been variations of these for many years, um, but uh, these are much more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Or she I mean, low setting of the blow dryer, figured out like what distance it should be. Yeah. Kept an eye on it. <laughs> yeah, had a thermometer in there, it's all in. Um, and those are the times when we had to do graduate and a lot of things. I Which one? Did you? Yeah. Claire was, I think Claire was the first one to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> a blow dryer? Yeah. I love the dice one, actually. Very low flow. <laughs> low um, yeah, right. So these guys are awesome because they enclose. Um, not just all of your sample, but they enclose a good chunk of the microscope that keeps all of the objective heaters, uh, uh, objectives warm as well in the stage. So this very stable temperature. We routinely have people do week long time lapses on these with relatively not finicky cells. Um, and they're great. Um, one of the downsides is that if you want to turn it off, it's going to take a long time for all of the metal in that microscope to equilibrate back down to temperature. And while it's in that cooling phase, you're going to see a shit ton of X, Y, and Z um, drift. So it's really quite unusable in that phase. And then the same thing when you want to turn it back on. So they really are, in my opinion, best used. Put it on, turn it on, and never turn it off. Um, and so if you're in this position where you can dedicate the microscope to, you know, 37 degree live cell imaging, that's very the best way to do it. Also, in this big sample, the 37 degrees. Yeah. 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 I'm thinking like you're in a lab that has frogs and, and mammalian cells, then you'd have to fight it out. But, but yeah, you can put, you can put your, I mean, you know, we can, we can go caveat, caveat. Your objective lenses are designed to be work, to be used at, um, at room temperature. So they're not going to perform as well at, their, at 37 degrees. But, you know, that's probably me getting a little pickier than is necessary for your average person. Um, and then they do nice things like put a black um, covering on them to block light so you don't have to be necessarily be working in the dark all the time. Okay, so here's the measurements that a former technician of mine who now works for Opal Lab actually um, made where we were, we were thinking about the humidity. Um, so she turned the incubator on, we're measuring temperature and humidity in the incubator and the temperature goes up pretty quickly. That's the temperature of the air. It takes a lot, much longer for the, the microscope itself to run up, but not surprisingly, of course, actually pause for a second. This was a microscope that was that is delivering humidity to the sample, right? But nonetheless, you get this dramatic drop in humidity as the, the, um, the chamber heats up. 
So this is a problem that we that comes up a lot for us. It's probably a lot easier out here because you have a constant temperature and humidity year round. Um, in Boston, <laughs> it's a little different. So we don't have these uh, humidity problems very often in the summer, but in the winter when the heat kicks on and the and the humidity goes like negative 20% is what it feels like, um, then these things are work, they, the, these incubators that deliver humidified air to the sample are working against the ambient humidity. And so even if you are delivering constant humidity you know, it totally depends on the ambient humidity. So every winter, every winter we get people who their cells are drying out more than they used to. Um, so definitely something, even if you have a mechanism in the incubation chamber to deliver humidified air, and I kind of skipped over that. So let me go back and say that the way that these incubators generally deliver CO2 and humidity is you have like a CO2 tank or some sort of CO2 and they might, you know, either you're delivering 5% CO2 or they come with a mixer. So in, in some way you're getting 5% um, CO2 into a little localized chamber that sits, or a little localized box that sits on top of your chamber. So it's just like a smaller enclosure because you don't want to fill the whole incubator with CO2. Um, <laughs> and so it, you know, it, it brings CO2 in and that CO2 is generally like bubbled through some sort of distilled water system to humidify it, okay? But it's not totally enclosed. It's not like you're sealing your sample in there. It's not going to maintain constant humidity the way your incubation chamber, your tissue culture incubation chamber does. Um, you know, it's constantly leaking out. So depending on the type of sample that you have and et cetera, it can it cannot maintain high enough humidity to prevent all evaporation. So pro tip for that, we'll start with the second one, is this just make all the difference. You can buy mineral oil. You buy it from CVS. If you're meant to drink it when you have issues. Um, so it's, you know, can be consumed by humans. I assume it's pretty safe for yourself too. You can also, if you're worried, you can buy it from Sigma, you know, for way more money, tissue culture grade, um, immersion oil. But if you have, or sorry, mineral oil, don't use immersion oil. <laughs> um, but if you have like a 35 millimeter dish with your with your media in there and you dump some, some mineral oil on the top and let it, you got to put enough to the, spreads all the way across and basically seals it on there, right? Seals it in. Then that allows gas, the mineral oil allows gas exchange, but it doesn't allow evaporation and it's optically clear. So it's like the perfect solution to this. I've never seen it not work for anybody, um, but I don't see it that common. Do you, have you learned from that? I've never seen any problem with it. Uh, okay, but you've, you've done it before. You've seen it or seen people do it before. It doesn't seem to be as like, I, a lot of people seem to have not, on the process, of those yeah. days, but, but it's a really good trick. Yeah. 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 I mean, for for things to evaporate, you do need some time. So if you're just imaging for an hour or so, but if you want to do like a 24 hour experiment, you're going to have to deal with this. And so another thing is, if you have a more simple chamber that isn't delivering CO2. This is a case where you might need to swap out the, the media for a different media to image in. And a couple of things that you can do is that you can add 25 millimolar heat to you know, your, your standard DMEM or whatever you're using. And that will just give it a little ex extra buffer, buffering capacity. And that is usually fine for, again, a reasonably short experiment in the hours range, not in the week range. Um, there are also now, uh, I took it out, it's Gimco. I don't know why. Oh, because I thought we were going to live stream and I didn't want to have any company names. I didn't want to endorse, I'm not allowed to endorse anything as a Harvard employee. Um, <laughs> you're fired if I can. Um, but anyway, Gibco makes one called, that they call CO2 independent media. Last, at last check, they didn't make a phenol red free version. And it has, I haven't brought this up, but phenol red is, a, is the pH indicator that's in tissue culture media. It's a fluorophore. And so there's no reason to use it when you're doing live imaging. Just don't use phenol red in your media. Um, but yeah. Since you're both stuff in outer space, but you mentioned that you've done a lot of manual culture light imaging. In my core, people in my core stuff. Right. Yeah, like, fair. Um, we were recently switching over to the phenol red free mm -hmm. neuron based photo media that we used to make our uh, lighting media. Okay. As far as I've known, I've tested a lot. I don't see any major differences. But to your knowledge, have you guys heard of any problems like 
Would that be a, like, is there something that I'm saying that's also going to be problematic? Problematic for the cell? Do you mean you mean the problem is it's possible? Yeah, like just I mean, I mean, you know, red is not for the cells; it's for you, so you can tell it the pH. Right, no, but I just felt like as far as like, the formulation differences, that they have to change something else. My understanding is they just don't add the phenol red to it. Now, whether or not I thought you what I thought you were going to ask is whether or not the phenol red really does make a difference. Being in the media, if you're if you have a tissue pulp, a, a 35 millimeter dish that has like a few mil, mils of phenol red in there, and you put that on a wide field microscope, you're going to see the background. If you put it on a point scanner or even a spinning dish, you're blocking out the majority of that, so it may not make as big of a difference. But I'm just big on not putting chloroform in your sample when you're doing microscopy. You can get away with it in the brain if you have anything, but you can't. Yeah. This is my last slide, so feel free to. So don't do it. Don't do phenol red in your live interview. Yeah, there's just no reason to. Oh, I don't know if phenol red is actually a flu if undergoing a fluorescent reaction. It does. It does emit light. Like like if you will detect it. You're increasing your back. Yes, you're increasing the back. And hopefully you go down. Oh, plastic is very slow. Yeah, it's 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 how much how much of a problem is like preparing hydrogen with oil? Like the the change in your factory index of the inversion media when you're getting out the temperature for instance at 27 degrees like that. Oh, the behavior, how does the uh, yeah. immersion oil yeah. behavior change? Yeah, it does. It, it can change the dispersion of the immersion oil. Yeah, it can change the refractive right. index. It can change all of the properties of immersion oil that matter to you. So yeah, this is a good point. If you're using your immersion oil at 37 degrees, not only is it going to be, in most cases, far less viscous and annoying and drip all over the place, um, it may not behave the way it should. And so there are commercially available immersion medias that are designed to be work used at 37 degrees. This is a little tricky because I don't think like when you when you buy an immersion oil, you, you can buy it from the microscope manufacturer and you should because they design their lenses to work with that oil. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can buy cheaper Fisher oil, but it wasn't designed to be work used with that lens. It'll probably work to some degree, but unless if you're looking carefully, it, it is there's going to be some negative phenotype for that almost certainly. Um, same thing with the 37 degree oil. I, I I don't know if the companies make their own. I don't think I've seen any. Maybe Zeiss has Zeiss a 37. Sense. Yeah, I don't think Nikon does. But I don't know. I can. But um, the key is if you're going to switch immersion oil, what you want to do is a point spread function to see how the point spread function looks. And you want to do it in multiple color. So sometimes it, it's the dispersion that is that really changes. So you'll you'll get more chromatic aberration. Like it might be the single point spread function looks fine, but you have big chromatic shift because of that different image color. Yeah, yeah, keep it in the incubator. You want it to stay at 37 degrees. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Hurry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> in one of the slides, we were talking about uh, objective. And talk about NA, and you also talk about the uh, refractive index. In this talk? In this talk, there was, there was a slide that made me think of this question, but hopefully you can find it. Well, there's not that many slides, so I hope I would be able to. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Minimize spherical aberration and use a higher NA less. Mm -hmm. so you, you probably even made a simulation. <laughs> you will by the end of this talk. 
You don't have as much spherical aberration. Mm -hmm. And a higher NAA is your friend. So you could use a 1.4 NA oil check. Yeah. And you start to move away from the cover slip. Spherical aberration starts to dominate. Mm -hmm. And maybe your water and there's an objective. Okay, back. I'm just going to stop you there because Kelly has made a position. Kelly has a simulator yeah. that is. Um, uh, uh, you, yeah, you choose the refractive, and I guess the glass is probably constant. You can choose the refractive index of the immersion media, the refractive index of the sample. You want to? I don't remember what it is. You can keep talking. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but you can't stop. It's to see where the distance, where, where it becomes a good distance. Yeah. Switch to the 1.2. But there's some limited range. The 1.4 may be the best. Um, I don't know yeah, what there's, just, I understand. there's some there's some point at which the mismatch between the immersion oil and the sample is such that if you go higher in A, you get one sample. Yeah. Right. These are these are that's true. I don't know if um if you did it with me not sure. <laughs> what I'm saying. But yeah, it, but the answer to that is always, in my opinion, if you have two objectives and you're trying to decide between them. It's never one property of the objective that's going to differ between those two. Like they are different objectives. And you can see that, you know, maybe one has one NA and one has the other, but there's probably other differences as well. Even just that they're just different objectives that have different life experiences. So empirically comparing them is that. But it's fun to think about it. This is this is just showing the problem that Uri was talking about, which is that like. Do you remember the slide? This is sort of the same slide Jennifer showed, which is like we've got the black lines are the line are 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 the emission or the collect what we're collecting, right? It's emitting from the specimen, refracting at the cover slip. We collect it somewhere. The dashed red lines are essentially what would be focused onto the camera, but we're superimposing them over the emission lines. You can sort of ignore. Actually, maybe we'll hide the object rays and just and show this. The point is, like at the cover slip, and and, and again, spherical aberration is this is this phenomenon where all the lines aren't coming to focus at the same spot anymore, right? Um, and at the cover slip, everything is great. But as you go deeper, if 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 you have a difference between your oil refractive index here and your sample, right? Like if the sample is in a high refractive index mounting media, no problem, everything is lovely. But if you are in water, you have a problem. And what Uri was sort of pointing out is that that problem depends on the NA. If we have a very, very low NA lens, it's sort of not a big deal. But as the NA goes up, the if you were to try to, like, the, the challenge here is, can I bundle all of these rays into the same spot? And you, you'll note that no. Like, these are focusing up here. These are focusing down here, right? There's a big spread. It's called the it's called the circle of least confusion. It's 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 spread out. Um, anyway, that that's the uh, the, the URL. Oh, no. Use the oil on I back to the water with the high NA. Yes, right. Yes, exactly. So if you use an, a, a water lens, you can sort of correct this. But then the NA becomes a little bit smaller because you're going one point two versus. So you can play with that. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>